say a few words before I introduce our speaker. You'll move. Um, my name is Megan Dunn. I'm the Chief of Staff here at George Washington's Mount Vernon. Um, you're in for a wonderful presentation, but before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to thank the Ford Motor Company for supporting Mount Vernon for so many years and for um, continuing to provide us this opportunity for a monthly book talk, which is very popular and we're thrilled that you're here. Um, I'd also like to rec uh, recognize excuse me, some very special guests in the audience. We have... Um, our George Washington Leadership Fellows here with us. There are 16 students here who are spending five weeks on the estate um, immersed in a leadership program inspired by George Washington's life and legacy. Um, they are here uh, through the generosity of David M. Rubenstein, who um, made a wonderful gift and helped us um, conceive of the idea to have this group of students here. I'd like you all to stand so we can recognize you. This is our second class of fellows. They've uh, just arrived this week and have some very busy schedules, but they're um, wonderful to speak with. If you get a moment to say hello to them, I think you'd enjoy it. Um, it's now my honor to be able to introduce tonight's speaker, Fergus Bordwick. Um, he holds degrees from the City College of New York and Columbia University. He's been an independent historian and writer since the early 1970s. He is a frequent speaker who has also worked as a journalist, which allowed him to travel the globe. Uh, writing on politics, economics, history, and more. His articles have appeared in numerous magazines and newspapers, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and Smithsonian. Mr. Bordwick is the author of seven nonfiction books, including Washington, The Making of the American Capital, Bound for Canaan, The Underground Railroad, and The War for the Soul of America, and America's Great Debate, Henry Clay, Stephen A. Douglas, and the Compromise that Preserved the Union, which won the Los Angeles Times Book Prize in History. He's currently working on a new book focusing on Congress's role during the Civil War. And tonight, he's going to join us to speak about his latest book, The First Congress, How James Madison, George Washington, and a Group of Extraordinary Men Invented the Government. Please join me in welcoming Fergus Fordwick. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I assume you can hear me clearly enough in the back? Yes. Not too loud, I hope? Okay. Uh, uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm going to allow as much time as I can for questions afterward because I know this is going to be a, both a well-informed and, and provocative group of people. Uh, not every group I speak to is. Uh, occasionally, I find myself saying, no, there were two houses of Congress, you know. <laughs> Fortunately, I'm not worried about that tonight. And naturally, I want to thank Mount Vernon for having me here and uh, for providing such a, a wonderful venue for this talk. Um, this uh, new book of mine, The First Congress, was inspired by an earlier book, uh, uh, which was already mentioned about the creation of Washington, D.C. Why, why are we here and not on the Susquehanna River in Pennsylvania? Or, in my favorite candidate for, a, uh, for the nation's uh, seat of government, the South Bronx. <laughs> I'm, I'm a native New Yorker. It's a bit chauvinistic. But, uh, uh, but at any rate, I wrote a book about the politics of the creation of the seat of government, the national capital, in the 1790s. And that occurred, that, that political decision occurred as one of the um, actions of the first Congress, first federal Congress. And it became readily apparent to me that that Congress, which was prodigiously productive, and I think uh, there's no question that it ranks among the three or four most effective, successful, productive Congresses in American history, if not the most productive. Um, and in writing this book, this is a narrative history. This is a narrative history. And uh, I, I, I know there are people, I think actually a lot of people, who think there is no more boring narrative than, uh, than congressional debate. 
Um, however, I don't think that's true at all. And in writing this book, I tried to imagine myself as kind of a fly on the wall, a spectator in the gallery of the House of Representatives. It couldn't be the gallery of the Senate because there was no gallery in the Senate. The Senate was a closed body at the time. It had no, no, it allowed no guests or visitors and uh, it made no record of its actions, though there is a wonderfully uh, tart and sarcastic diary that was kept by one of my favorite, though very difficult to like, members of the First Congress, William McClay of Pennsylvania. And, and if uh, you still want to know more about the First Congress after you've read my book, or even if just after this, uh, I recommend McClay's diary. It's in print. Uh, so I try to imagine myself as a uh, fly on the wall, uh, watching the debates unfold in front of me without knowing the outcome. Because of course, when members met in, in March and April of 1789, nobody knew the outcome. And trust me that nobody was confident it was going to succeed. Uh, plan A had been the Confederation Congress, which failed. Plan B was this, the, federal, the first federal Congress, and there was no Plan C. Uh, so I tried to write as if in real time. And I tried to capture the often dramatic, very dramatic political give and take the verbal combat, which was often on a marvelous level considering who many of these men were, and the often very grudging struggle toward compromise in the face of fear of failure. Let's, let's give you something better to look at here. Well, okay, let me explain these first two images. This is New York in 1789, and we are standing approximately in front of Federal Hall, looking towards the East River, of New York uh, and, and the city even then, although the buildings are only five, four or five stories high, had some of the bustle and teeming quality that, that, that it's had for the last 200 years. Uh, so Federal Hall, even though the image of it that I'm going to show you in a minute looks very austere and classical, it's here. Uh, and this is another image of New York and there may be uh, somebody in this audience, but I, I, I would, I would, I, I, I bet a buck, probably not, who knows that this house is standing at the Manhattan end of the Holland Tunnel. Uh, it's not there anymore. Uh, this was the house that uh, Vice President John Adams uh, rented uh, for the two sessions that the First Congress met in New York. And why am I showing it to you? To convey some sense of how rural, how bucolic Manhattan was in 1789. The city, the city ended about where New York's City Hall is today. If you went beyond City Hall, you were going out of town. Uh, and uh, this stood, uh, this building stood uh, approximately a mile and a half, a mile and a half, maybe two miles from New York City. Uh, and uh, when members of the first Congress uh, needed a break, and that was often because it was very exhausting and these fellows were, were, were working six and seven days a week, uh, they went for walks or, or horseback uh, rides in the countryside. And that countryside is often the land uh, below Houston Street in, in today's New York. Greenwich Village was out there somewhere. Uh, so that's the New York that we're in, and this is Federal Hall, where just about all the action is taking place. It's on Wall Street, uh, the coffee house, that is to say the teeming scene that I showed you first, is, is behind us. And we're now looking in the direction of the uh, Hudson River. Okay, so the first Congress. Despite its significance, the first Congress has, I think, generally been treated as something like an asterisk after the Constitutional Convention, as if the government that the Constitution outlined, and that's what it was, it was an outline, sprang full grown from that document, like Athena springing from the forehead of, of Zeus, uh, which it didn't. It took two years of highly creative and sometimes really two-fisted down and dirty politics to accomplish 
the job. And that job was creating the institutions of government, of creating what uh, Patrick Henry, whom I'm going to refer to once or twice later on, referred to as the crazy machine of government. Uh, so that's what these men are doing in Federal Hall here. When the first Congress gathered in New York, as I said, March and April 1789, why do I say two months? Because it took them more than a month to get a quorum. Everybody who showed up on time, including James Madison, was in a blind panic that not enough people would even turn up to make, to, to make a Congress. Uh, and they, in their, their letters to others, they express a fear that they'd failed before they even gotten, had even gotten started. So, the challenges facing the country are terrific. It's a, it's a, the country is a very shaky collection of 11 sovereign states, North Carolina and Rhode Island, governed by anti-federalists. Those are the folks who didn't like the Constitution, haven't yet joined the Union. Opponents of the Constitution are demanding rafts of amendments, more than 200 amendments, uh, or even a new constitutional convention. The government has no reliable source of revenue. There are more than 50 different currencies in circulation. There's no permanent seat of government. Government had been nomadic for the most part in the 1780s. Southerners are, are suspicious of Northerners and, and Westerners of Easterners and New Englanders of just about everyone. Uh, and there are very well-founded fears that the West will break off. The, when we're speaking of the West here, of course, we're not talking about Montana and Idaho and South Dakota. We're talking about west of the Appalachians. We're talking about what eventually or soon becomes Kentucky and Tennessee and, and uh, Ohio and Indiana and Illinois. And that's about as far west as anybody can imagine at this point. Uh, there are fears that the West will break off into another country or maybe several countries. Quakers and others are demanding an end to slavery, while Southerners threaten secession. And they do so in the course of the First Congress, threaten secession if government dares to tamper with slavery. And as I've said, and I'll repeat it probably a few more times, even many members of Congress doubt that the government's going to survive its birth. As James Madison put it, and he said this a number of times, we are in a wilderness without a single footstep to guide us. Yet, yeah, the First Congress achieved a prodigious output. It established the executive departments, the federal court system, the first revenue streams for the national government. It approved the first amendments to the Constitution. It adopted a program for paying the country's debts. And it embraced the principles of capitalism as the underpinning of government financial policy. It founded the first national bank. It established, obviously, the national capital on the banks of the Potomac. It enacted the first patent and copyright laws, founded the US Coast Guard, and I could go on. Uh, the members of the first Congress didn't regard themselves as demigods. They never expected anyone else to consider them as that either. The great majority of them were, gasp, professional politicians. Most of them were, gasp, gasp, lawyers. Uh, uh, this was not a Congress of amateurs. Nobody, nobody threw down his plow, jumped on his mule, and, and, and rode to New York and legislated for a while and then went back to the farm to finish plowing. Nobody. Um, nobody tore off his cobbler's leather, leather, leather apron to legislate. These men are professionals. Uh, they're overwhelmingly pragmatists. There were no ideological zealots. One or two were a little bit crazy, and a few others were famously a bit lazy. And a number of others, it seems, uh, from time to time, had to be pulled out of the taverns and brothels of the, uh, of the East Side, uh, for some whose names don't occur very often in the record. Uh, but among, among these men, we'll come back to him in a minute. You know who that is. Oh. James Madison. James Madison stands out as the leading figure, particularly in the first crucial session. 
of Congress. There were three sessions, two in New York, the third in Philadelphia. He served, in effect, as the floor leader in the House. There were, there were I should remind you, there was no structure, as we, as we know, that Congress has today. There were no majority, minority leaders, whips, and there was no structure of seniority at all. Madison was recognized by most everyone as the foremost interpreter of the Constitution, to which he contributed arguably more than anyone else. He was a brilliant parliamentarian, and I'll tell you a story about that uh, if there's time. Uh, one, of, one of his a truly stunning maneuver that, that, that borders on sleight of hand that buffaloed the rest of the House and was fundamental to bringing the Capitol here as opposed to being elsewhere where Congress had already voted to put it. Brilliant parliamentarian, and he had the complete confidence of the single most charismatic man in the United States, George Washington. Uh, so, let's go back. This is uh, George in, his, in a very presidential sort of pose, and, and this is a conjectural rendering of, of Washington arriving for his inauguration. Uh, I'm going to take the liberty of reading a short bit from the book here. Um, I hate to slash my own words, but I have here, so I'm just going to read excerpts. Um, and when I begin here, um, we're here at Mount Vernon. This is, this is uh, George Washington here at Mount Vernon. Washington considered the sluggishness in getting the government up and running to be a national embarrassment. He was determined not to add to it. As this delay must be very irksome to the attending members, I am resolved no interruption shall proceed from me that can well be avoided, he assured James Madison by, by mail. Madison's in New York. The House of Representatives was still debating codfish and molasses when on the afternoon of April 22nd, <coughs> Congress learned that George Washington had reached the Jersey Shore. Washington left Mount Vernon accompanied by his aide, David Humphreys, his secretary, Tobias Lear, his enslaved manservant, Billy Lee, and the hopeful Charles Thompson, uh, uh, who, who, a man who might have headed a, an executive department but didn't. Uh, they crossed the Potomac at Georgetown, headed north toward Baltimore across the rolling hills that some Potomac Valley promoters, Washington among them, hoped might become the site of the nation's permanent capital. He had hoped to travel in as quiet and peaceable a manner as possible to conserve his energy. But that was not to be. The entire route was as warm with cheering, shouting, flag-waving well-wishers, throwing flowers at him, holding up their babies, and demanding speeches. Towns that had cannon fired them. Veterans marched alongside him for miles. Men wept. Banners proclaimed a new era and behold the rising empire. Though he slipped the crowds when he could, he agreed when pressed to deliver addresses in Baltimore, Wilmington, and Philadelphia, where 20,000 people, half the city's population, thronged the cobbled streets shouting, long live the father of his people. And a laurel wreath fit for a Roman emperor was placed on his head. More cheering crowds were waiting for him on the New Jersey bank of the Delaware River, where he had famously crossed during the war. Crisply uniformed cavalry and infantry escorted him to Trenton between ranks of girls crowned with garlands who strewed flowers before his feet and sang odes of glory. The Gazette of the United States proclaimed that Washington had become virtually divine, standing, quote, upon a scale of eminence that heaven never before assigned to a mortal. Expectations were high. Uh, uh, Finally, on the morning of April 23rd, at Elizabeth, New Jersey, he was met by a committee of both houses of Congress, John Jay, numerous New York City officials, and the uniformed rotundity of his Revolutionary War colleague, Henry Knox. Dressed in a blue and buff suit that recalled his wartime uniform, and seated imperially beneath an awning hung with red curtains, Washington was rowed across the Hudson River in a 47-foot barge manned by 13 pilots dressed in white garments and black caps as flag-festooned ships fired cannonades across the harbor. Uh, 
as if inspired by the jubilation, porpoises leaped and dove around the barge. <laughs> eyewitness, eyewitness account. Near Bedloe's Island, the future site of the Statue of Liberty, a boatload of gentlemen and ladies trilled a welcoming ode to the tune of God Save the King. As Washington neared the Manhattan shore, passed around the battery and turned north up the East River to the booming of artillery, huzzas rose from multitudes of men, women, and children packed as thick as ears of corn before the harvest. Another observer recalled the successive motion of hats being doffed from the battery to, to Murray's Wharf like the rolling of the sea. The panorama Washington later wrote filled my mind with sensations as painful, considering the reverse of this scene, which may be the case after all my labors to do good, as they are pleasing. In other words, he was pretty uptight. Uh, it was Washington's first trip back to New York since the end of the war. If any New Yorkers held him personally responsible for losing their city to the British in the catastrophic Battle of Long Island, they had clearly forgiven. He was filled with trepidation. All his sacrifices, the years of war and political struggle, the great experiment upon which the nation was about to embark, it might yet collapse into fiasco and come to nothing. An assembly of war veterans met him at Murray's Wharf. At the top of the steps, carpeted in his honor, an officer declared that a guard of honor was ready to take his orders. At this, Washington, turning to the crowd and with a democratic inspiration, declared that he would, he would accept the honor guard, but in truth, the affections of his fellow citizens was all the guard he wanted. He rejected the use of a carriage and preceded by a troop of cavalry, artillery, and uniformed officers, New York Governor George Clinton, New York's mayor, assorted clergymen, and an amazing concourse of ordinary citizens strode slowly through the streets, hung with silk banners, wreaths of flowers, and branches of evergreen to the mansion on Cherry Street, near the present-day Brooklyn Bridge, that had been rented for him. Later, the skies burst in a torrential downfall, downfall but no one seemed to care. Not that there weren't dissenters. To at least some Republicans, Washington's entire journey seemed like a royal progress that smacked of monarchical excess and hinted at the elevation of the new president into a sort of American king, a satirical and sacrilegious caricature that spread around New York labeled the entry showed Washington arriving in the guise of Jesus at the American Jerusalem of New York, sitting in Billy Lee's lap and mounted on a donkey led by David Humphreys wearing devil's horns and chanting, the glorious time has come to pass when David shall conduct an ass. <laughs> Less nastily, but in its own way, no less significant of ambivalence toward what some feared were Washington's monarchical pretensions, a member of Congress reported that a prominent Quaker who had lent assistance to the patriotic struggle, when told that Washington was approaching his house, replied with Quakerly disdain for ceremony that he was perfectly indifferent to the general commotion at the door and declined to rise from his dinner table as the president-elect's procession marched by. Now, I, I don't want to leave you on that kind of negative note there, and you'll, you'll realize as I go on that I, I just, I, I uh, think Washington's role in the course of the first Congress is really quite fascinating. So I'm gonna give you just one short snapshot here. Uh, this actually describes uh, the day of his inauguration shortly, uh, shortly afterward. But uh, it's a different note. As the inauguration approached, visitors poured into the city, filling taverns, boarding houses, and private homes. Every one of them was desperate for a glimpse of Washington. I have seen him, a young Boston woman breathlessly wrote home. I never saw a human being that looked so great and noble as he does. I could fall down on my knees before him and bless him. A landlady named Mary Daubing was so overwrought that she experienced a virtually orgasmic collapse. 
Her mind was so overcome by the expectation of seeing the president that it affected her whole frame in a very uncommon manner. It was so painful that though she promised herself much gratification, she wished it over. <laughs> so people responded to George in different ways. Uh, so, Washington's charisma and his wholehearted commitment to the Republican experiment, and that's what it was, an experiment, were powerful assets for the fragile government. But Congress, you have to remember, was the most powerful branch of that government. It was there, not in Washington's mansion, that the real decisions were made, that plans for the country were proposed, and fundamental conflicts hashed out. Washington was a Republican, small r Republican, in his bones, in his bones. Despite this adulation, and Americans had no idea of what a chief executive might be like except King George III. So it's not perhaps as startling that people responded in some of the ways that I was describing here because they don't know what the president is. There's never been a president. George Washington's going to invent it. Um, uh, Washington, of course, had no agenda of his own to advance. He had no program for his first hundred days, which is a millstone that has been hung around the neck of every president since FDR, uh, uh, generally by, by the media, pundits, and the opposition, in order to be able to say, if the president hasn't accomplished what we expected him to do, fulfilled his promises in the first hundred days, he's a failure. Uh, and I don't think any president benefits from that. I think we ought to retire the phrase. It certainly didn't exist in 1789. And when I said Cong uh, Washington was a Republican in his bones, he looked to Congress for leadership, not the other way around. And his hands trembled at his inauguration, and that was for good reason, he, because he knew that everything he said or did would set a precedent for better or worse. Uh, well, I, sh I, should, I should quote you at least a, a, a phrase or two of wh how, how Washington was thinking. And before he set out for New York, he, he confided to a neighbor here, uh, near where we are right now. And he said, from the moment when the necessity of accepting the office of chief executive had become apparent and, as it were, inevitable, I anticipated in a heart filled with distress the 10,000 embarrassments, perplexities, and troubles to which I must again be exposed in the evening of a life already near consumed in public cares. Now, one of the first challenges occurred in the very, very first weeks of Congress, and it hinged on a seemingly innocuous question, just what was the chief executive to be called. He might not have been president. And um, this is where John Adams steps in and basically ruins the vice presidency for all eternity. <laughs> um, uh, first Congress spent weeks, weeks debating what to call the chief executive. Now, Adams, who repeatedly, with a kind of Nixonian charisma, I dare say, uh, <laughs> inserted himself in the Senate debates, essentially aggravating everyone uh, and uh, diminishing the office of vice president nearly with his every utterance. Uh, I don't hate John Adams, but the, the, the first, this, these were not his best years. Uh, uh, Adams considered his most benign highness, or at least his highness, as the barest acceptable forms of address, although he preferred his high mightiness. <laughs> and he dismissed president as fit for nothing more than the leader of fire companies or a cricket club. <laughs> Others proposed that the name Washington should itself become a title, like Caesar or Augustus in ancient Rome, to be to be bestowed on future presidents. Fortunately, George Washington would have none of it. He rejected all these grandiose titles as offensive to the leveling American spirit. And although he was obviously a patrician, 
a slave owner, a military man accustomed to command and to obedience, he was a Republican and he regarded Congress as the core of the nation's government. Um, and under, but underpinning his, his republicanism was an unbreachable quality of self-restraint, modesty, and respect for the dignity of his fellow men, including those he disagreed with. And as far as he was concerned, the, the, the humble title of president was just fine. Thank you, George. I think we're all grateful for that. Um, we've, certainly, we've certainly had some uh, presidents, more than a few, I dare say, who we would have had a difficult time addressing as his high mightiness. P depending where you are on the spectrum, pick your choices, you know. Uh, so, Congress, the first Congress didn't accomplish anything with a group hug. You know, they, 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 didn't, they didn't sing a 1789 version of Kumbaya. Uh, uh, they did it mainly through, as I said earlier, pragmatic and sometimes shameless deal-making of the sort that's ritually disparaged by modern ideologues and idealists alike. And it often involved, more than many of us would like to think, the suspension of personal principles in order to get things done. The French ambassador, who was a very, very acute observer of this first Congress, observed, the intrigues, the cabals, the underhanded and insidious dealings of a factious and turbulent spirit are even much more frequent in this republic than in the most absolute monarchy. The turbulence he's describing is Republican government at work. I, I want to give you, I think, one uh, one good example, a serious example. Uh, uh, there are so many, there are so many, but uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about the, the battle over amendments. Um, since we're going to do that, let's, let's find Madison again. Uh, and there's some surprising, some surprising aspects to this. Today we think of the Bill of Rights as one of the most majestic components of the constitutional system, rightly so. Uh, but many of the men who created the Constitution didn't want amendments at all. And the amendments as we know them were the product of a political sausage machine. S State ratifying conventions had called for more than 200 amendments, many of which demanded a rebalancing of power to favor the state governments. In other words, to push the system back in the direction of the failed confederation. Or one might say, if one really wanted to go out on a limb, forward in the direction of the Confederacy of 1861. Uh, and I'm, I'm not saying that as loosely as you might imagine. Uh, state ratifying conventions called for all these amendments. Many of them were overlapping, but they tended to focus also on limiting the jurisdiction of federal courts, banning federal taxes of any kind, the creation of commissions that could override unpopular Supreme Court decisions, restraints on the power of Congress to oversee even federal elections, and many other drastic changes that would have gutted the Constitution. Uh, we can thank James Madison that they didn't succeed. Most Federalists, and Madison of course comes into the first Congress as, as a leading Federalist, a leading Nationalist, and he diverges from that in the course of the first Congress. But as far as the amendments were concerned, he was, he was carrying a Nationalist banner. Uh, most Federalists strongly opposed any amendments. Um, some of them were peeved at Madison for countenancing any. Uh, Madison would today, I think, undoubtedly be rather unkindly smeared as a consummate flip-flopper. Uh, he had opposed amendments very, very vigorously, rejected amendments of any kind until running as a candidate for Congress in what was a largely anti-federalist district of Virginia against uh, uh, James Monroe, by the way. Uh, he suddenly claimed to have been a supporter of amendments for quite a while. And now in Congress, he declared that actually he pretty much opposed them. Uh, certainly opposed any that were of a doubtful nature, very precise term. Uh, 
So, in short, he was against them before he was for them, before he was against them again. But, but seriously, he was behaving like the clever, not to say brilliant, somewhat inconsistent, patriotic politician that he was, by putting aside often stated principles for what he considered the greater national interest, which at this point was appeasing strident anti-federalists who demanded quite a bit more than he intended to give them. Having promised amendments, Madison had to deliver. So working feverishly, he was nothing if not a, 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 a compulsive worker. He compressed the 200 amendments into 19 committees in which Madison participated.